Hello everyone, my name is Dominic Guthrie and I am a Master of Science student at the University of Alberta and I'm happy to talk to you today about my research on the statistical approach on the analysis of a clay shale slope using two and three dimensional methods. So as we all know, there are many natural landslides in clay shale slopes across the Canadian prairies which pose a hazard to the Canadian rail industry. Many of these landslides can be classified as translational in nature and they often find their shear planes located in scenes of bentonite. This class of landslide has been assessed and analyzed extensively over the decades due to technical properties of clay shale and bentonite, slide kinematics, and failure mechanisms have all been well established in literature. Some examples include the famous Grierson Hill landslide in Edmonton, a landslide which has uh, caused technical challenges for decades, the Lesueur landslide, also in Edmonton, the Devon landslide, and not to mention many landslides in the Peace River area. A two-dimensional limit equilibrium models has been one of the most significant tools for analysis and assessment. However, there is an increasing amount of more complex modeling tools at our disposal. So this research project really aims to revisit a well-studied and documented landslide such that I can develop a three-dimensional limit equilibrium model. And the objectives are threefold. First, use the developed model to investigate 3D effects on this class of landslide. Generic 3D effects are well established in literature. However, this study permits for a tailored analysis to translational slides seated in clay shales. Second is to use the model to reassess the failure mechanism via a back analysis. And third is to implement a statistical approach to the said back analysis. A statistical approach can evaluate material properties and the failure mechanism in its own right. And this research aims to develop property distributions for future analyses, as well as quantify the 3D effect uh, for consideration in future analyses on a regional scale. So the selected landslide was the White Mud Road landslide of 99 in Edmonton, Alberta. This was a significant event for the city and remembered very well by the public. On October 23rd, approximately a quarter million cubic meters of soil and rock dislodged from the riverbank, upon which had several houses. The head of the slide dropped approximately 18 meters, while 20% of the material cascaded into the river below. Unfortunately, one house did slide down into the river, uh, and two others were actually condemned and then destroyed. This resulted in a multi-million dollar lawsuit between landowners, the city, engineering firms, and the developer. Of course, this event made national headlines, so I have here a short newsreel from CBC showing the slide and the loss of property. While the two houses expected to crash into the riverbank are still clinging to the slope, the owners have less to cling to. I mean, it's just waiting. You know, what can we do? What Bob Reed can't do is go back into his home. That's because it's teetering on the edge of the bank. His belongings are packed, ready to go inside the garage. Seven houses remain evacuated. The Carters were lucky. They're taking their possessions with them and they're not sure where they will be living permanently. So hopefully this provides some context to the scale and the destruction caused by the slide. So obviously the city had commissioned an investigation which was carried out by AMEC, now known as Wood, and the investigation was quite extensive. Between 99 and 2000, 21 boreholes had been drilled and logged with a series of inclinometers, pneumatic piezometers in the bedrock, uh, and standpipe piezometers in the overburden material, uh, were installed. In addition to the site investigation, direct shear tests were conducted on samples of bedrock. So in addition to this investigation, two other investigations in the area were conducted in the 70s for the extension of the White Mud Road, as well as the development of the residential, residential subdivision known as Ramsey Heights. All of this data over 30 years, in addition to the wealth of knowledge on the geology of Edmonton, provides the perfect opportunity to develop a 3D model. Ultimately, it was indeed found that the failure was seeded in bentonite, and after estimating the slip surface by use of inclinometers and geometry of the slide, the factor of safety was calculated given the residual strength, softened strength, and peak strength. So for this reason, among others, it was concluded that fully softened strength was mobilized at failure. The triggering effect was attributed to a rise in groundwater levels, which was possibly caused by a significant amount of rainfall in years prior, to the slide event, as well as excess water um, infiltration due to residential development. Not only does this excess groundwater lead to softening, but it also increases pore water pressure, 
and enables erosion of the slope. So to give a quick overview of the geology for context, this here is a cross section of the slide after it failed. The bedrock is of the Upper Cretaceous period and is an interbedded mixture of clay shale, siltstone, sandstone, coal seams, and of course thin seams, uh, thin seams of bentonite. Above the bedrock is approximately 8 meters of clay till, which was deposited by the ice sheet from the Wisconsin era. And I will point out that there is a sand lens within the clay till, and it is very common to see this throughout the Edmonton region. Above the till we find approximately 30 meters of sand, and this is a cane structure, which is a type of uh, glacial structure, and it is unique to the area, and not to be confused with the Empress sand. And of course above this we find a couple meters of glacial clustering clay, that was deposited in Lake Edmonton. So the stratigraphy is not overly complex, so the stratigraphic units were extrapolated to create a pre-failure geologic model. Uh, but of course, the stratigraphy isn't overly complex for the overburden material. But the bedrock is an interbedded mixture of materials, uh, so a more strategic method was used to model separate lithologies in the bedrock. To be brief, the contacts between lithologies recorded in boreholes served as, as points to model a contact surface. Now, in terms of geotechnical properties, a significant review of literature was undertaken to get a better estimate of the shear strength properties, and the residual strength of bentonite in particular had quite a range with reported values as low as 3 degrees and as high as 13 degrees. As seen in figure 15a, the factor of safety is highly dependent on this particular parameter. This is when I got inspired to take a statistical approach. So distributions were developed instead of uh, deterministic values. For example, instead of saying strength of bentonite was assumed to be 8.5 degrees, we can say we assumed it had a normal distribution with a mean of 8.5 degrees with a standard deviation of 1.1. A similar approach was taken for all the materials of interest. So if you recall, the bedrock uh, is actually an interbedded mixture of several materials, and this includes a variety of clay shales including bentonitic and carbonaceous varieties. After conducting a F-test and T-test on the variance and means of the distributions respectively, it was found that there is no statistically significant difference between the distributions. What this means is that if we so choose, we should be able to model the clay shales homogeneously, or in other words, as one material. So now that we have distributions for material properties, a back analysis can be conducted. Now a traditional method is to vary a value of interest until the factor of safety approaches one, and in our case conducting a back analysis on the post failure mass and assuming the strength of the scarp was 33 degrees, we'd have a result of residual benchmark strength of 8.5 degrees. This is a deterministic and univariate result, and to improve this analysis a new method is used and it's called the Markov Chain Monte Carlo Simulation. In essence, this simulation combines the following three principles, Monte Carlo Simulations, Markov Chains, and the Bayesian Principle of Conditional Probability. So what is the probability of A given B? To briefly summarize, a Monte Carlo simulation is a method to sample from an unknown distribution, where you select random values from input parameters according to their distributions, and calculate the output. Repeat this a number of times, such that you can approximate a distribution for your output. A Markov chain is quite simple, actually. The probability of going to any state um, depends on the current state you are in. The schematic here implies three states, but the number of possible states is ultimately unlimited. Now, in terms of the conditional probability, probability of A given B, in our context, a is the distribution of the strength parameters, and B is the factor of safety. So, in, in plain English, what is the distribution of strength given that the line slide failed? So, benefits of this method include, as we already discussed, the results of the back analysis are distributions as opposed to deterministic values. Also, several values can be back calculated at once. In this project, we use up to 17 parameters. And of course, the correlation can be inferred between strength parameters, so not only does this make sense geologically speaking, but it can also give insight into the mechanism of failure. And of course, not everything is perfect, and this is no exception. So one of the major drawbacks is that uh, results are dependent on the initial guess, 
Therefore, reasonable quantities must be input to get meaningful results. Also, the factor of safety distribution can affect the spread of back calculated parameters. So using this method on the post-failure geometry is compared to the, to the traditional method. And though the deterministic value and the mean don't vary by a significant amount, the distribution serves as an input into a Monte Carlo simulation for the pre-failure geometry. When all the material was assumed to be softened, the resulting factor of safety was 0 0.96, with a probability of failure of 59%. However, at peak strength, the resulting factor of safety was 1.37, with a probability of failure of 4%. So it is clear that the material was only partially softened, but to what degree and with which materials? To answer this, we can modify the Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation. This time, the back calculated distribution does not only depend on a factor of safety of unity, but it also depends on the friction angles being at their peak values. The results show that on average, the bedrock was softened by 87%, but the overburden softened by 7%. There's also an average correlation of 0.8 between various bedrock materials. So this demonstrates that most of the failure mechanism can be attributed to the bedrock and that the differential softening between units is limited. This suggests that the rate of softening was constant and the access to water was ubiquitous. So using the same methods as the 2D analysis, the Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation was run on the post-failure geometry using the 3D model. The results show that the mean residual Bentonite strength was 8 degrees with a standard de deviation of 1.01. This implies that the 2D model overestimated, overestimated the mean strength by approximately 5% and under underestimated the standard deviation by 30%. So in essence, we can expect weaker strengths and more variable strengths in the Bentonite than the 2D back analysis will determine. Again, in a similar fashion to the 2D analysis, the resulting strength distribution was used as a statistical input for a traditional Monte Carlo simulation of the 3D model. The results showed that when all the bedrock was taken to be at residual, the factor of safety was 0.78 with a probability of failure of essentially 100%. Whilst if the bedrock was to be fully softened, the factor of safety was 1.06 with a probability of failure of 36%. So this suggests that bedrock may have been mobilizing the friction of uh, friction angle less than peak and that the overburden uh, possibly remained fully intact. So in a similar method to the 2D analysis, the Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation can be modified to estimate the degree with which the strength of, bed, uh, of bedrock was reduced from peak. The results show that 99% of the peak friction angle in bedrock was mobilized, however only 89% of the peak friction angle in bentonite was mobilized. Moreover, the correlation between different bedrock units was only 0.02. So this all suggests that the mechanism of failure can be solely attributed to the movement of bentonite. Additionally, the reduction in mobilized strength from peak suggests that progressive failure uh, may have been at play. So in light of these results, finite dif a finite difference model will be developed to further investigate the role of progressive failure in this particular landslide. And this here concludes my presentation. So I'd like to thank NSERC for their financial support. And I'd also like to extend my gratitude to Wood and the city of Edmonton for their contributions. Uh, this research would not have been possible without them. And here are my references for your leisure. And finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I am more than happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you.